Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me tonight on uh, another episode of this talk. So today we actually going to talk about the approach to mitral valve problems. So we will just start with the anatomy of the mitral valve. So this is uh, the view that is very important. We call this the surgeon view of the mitral valve. What is surgeon view? The surgeon view is when you cut the top of the heart and you look at the mitral valve and the, tra the tricuspid valve unfast, meaning looking at the top, looking towards the mitral valve. So this is the unfast view of the valve. So that's your mitral valve there. That's your tricuspid valve. And the middle there is your aortic valve. And the one that is the most anterior, meaning that the nearest to your sternum, is the pulmonary valve. Hello. All right, so um, I'm just sorry, I just have to lock the meeting. Um, so the tricuspid valve, as I mentioned before, have three leaflets. So you have septal, anterior, and posterior leaflet. And mitral valve have two leaflets. You have anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflet. The aortic valve and the pulmonary valve both have three leaflets. So today, we're going to talk about the underlying concept of uh, mitral valve and mitral regurgitation. We're going to talk about the Carpentier classification. So Carpentier classification is the classification of the mechanism of mitral regurgitation. We're going to talk about the echocardiogram assessment, meaning that how severe is mitral regurgitation just from looking at the echocardiogram. And we will look at a few cases. So number one, let me touch on the anatomy of the mitral valve here. So mitral valve have two leaflets. So you have the anterior leaflet there and you have the posterior leaflet here. Okay, now between leaflets of the posterior mitral valve, you have an indentation. So you have an indentation here, you have another indentation there. So that indentation actually separate the posterior mitral valve leaflets into three scallops. So you have P1 scallop, P2 scallop, and P3 scallops of the mitral valve. Now on the anterior mitral valve leaflet, there is no indentation. However, by convention, we just do opposite to the posterior mitral valve leaflet. So if this is P1, that is A1. If that is P2, that is A2. If that is P3, that is A3. Okay. So this is important because we can describe, for example, to the surgeon, which exactly the leaflet that is involved in pathology. Around the mitral valve leaflet is the mitral valve annulus. And the annulus of mitral valve comprise of tissue, fibrous tissue that is quite strong. So mitral valve is not as easily dilate as tricuspid valve. The tricuspid annulus only consists of the atrium and ventricle tissue. So the tricuspid annulus is more easily dilated compared to the mitral valve annulus. Another thing that you need to remember is that the both the leaflet of the mitral valve is actually attached to the papillary muscle. So you have anterolateral papillary muscle that is attached to the lateral part of the mitral valve. So both anterior and posterior. You have posterior medial papillary muscle that's attached to the medial part of the mitral valve leaflet, both the anterior and posterior. Another one very important thing is the posterior mitral valve leaflet is actually shorter than in anterior mitral valve leaflet. Now, because it is shorter than anterior mitral valve leaflet, as the left ventricular dilate and the papillary muscle is pulled upward, usually the posterior mitral valve leaflet will be affected more severely than anterior mitral valve leaflet. Therefore, most of mitral regurgitation, i.e. functional mitral regurgitation, be it ischemic mitral regurgitation or dilated cardiomyopathy, the jet is directed posteriorly. It can go centrally, but most of the time it is directed posteriorly. Therefore, if let's say you have ischemic mitral regurgitation because the posterior medial papillary muscle displaced upwards, it will cause tethering and tenting, especially of the posterior mitral valve leaflet and cause posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. Now, let's say a patient walk into your clinic with dyspnea, shortness of breath. And when you do physical examination, it reveals pan-systolic murmur. 
you look at the echo, echo is reported as severe mitral regurgitation. Remember, only severe mitral regurgitation warrant any intervention. When you see severe mitral regurgitation, you need to do a differential diagnosis. What is the reason of you having severe mitral regurgitation? So basically, we divide this into either the patient having annulus problem. Okay, this is one type of mitral regurgitation, quite special one, in which the problem is not the leaflet, the problem is not the ventricle, but chronic atrial fibrillation cause the atrial to be dilated and then you cause mitral regurgitation. Okay, quite a new entity. The abbreviation is AFMR, Atrial Functional Mitral Regurgitation. The other one is what we call leaflet problem. So leaflet problem is what we call primary problem. So there's few different types. The most common leaflet problem is what we call maximus degeneration and fibroelastin deficiency. This is a spectrum of disease where you have either prolapse or flail of your mitral valve leaflets. Other differential diagnosis for primary leaflet problem is sometimes you just get older and your leaflet become thickened and calcified, just like your aortic valve, and this can also cause mitral regurgitation. And lastly, less common in developed world, but very common in our world is rheumatic mitral regurgitation. So rheumatic valve disease not only cause stenosis, but also can cause regurgitation. And lastly, is the ventricle that is the problem. When the ventricle is problem, is either ischemic mitral regurgitation, which is a very specialized subtype of functional mitral regurgitation in which you have isolated inferior wall, regional wall motion abnormalities because of coronary artery disease. Functional MR or dilated cardiomyopathy is when you have symmetrical left ventricular dilatation. Usually the ejection fraction is less than 35% and you have symmetrical anterior and posterior papillary muscle displacement. Okay, so you have four types. One, you have annulus problem. Number two, you have leaflet problem. And number three, you have left ventricle problem. So this is your differential diagnosis of mitral regurgitation. When we talk about primary mitral regurgitation, when people say primary, they mostly are referring to maximum degeneration or fibroelastic deficiency, i.e. is the patient having prolapse of flail mitral valve. Okay, this is a primary mitral valve, and this is a quite common situation, especially happen in young-ish uh, groups of patients. So what happens is you have either leaflet prolapse or flail in one spectrum of this primary leaflet problem called maximum degeneration. The leaflet is very thick, and the other component is the annulus is actually very big as well. So if you have Barlow's disease or maximum degeneration, sometimes the annulus can be twice the normal size. So that's why even for primary leaflet pathologies, if we do mitral valve repair, we still need to put a ring because we wanted to reduce the annular dilatation in this primary mitral valve problem. When we do repair for primary mitral valve, what I mean is flail or prolapse, there is two types of mitral valve repair. One is called Carpentier repair, and this is the most common repair that has been done and the older one, and the other one is what we call a dynamic American correction, and I will tell you a bit later. So before we finish our talks, let's I start with take home message first so that maybe you can remember this even if you forget the rest of the talk. So number one, if you look at primary mitral regurgitation, i.e. mitral regurgitation because of prolapse of flame, you always repair if you can repair it, okay? If you replace a repairable mitral valve, you are you're making a great disservice to the patient because a mitral valve replacement gives 10 to 20 years survival penalty. All right. What do I mean by repair? Meaning that you don't replace the leaflet. Okay, you do some maneuver to the leaflet to correct the mitral regurgitation. Whenever you want to assess mitral regurgitation, look at 2D appearance of the leaflet carefully. Always try to ask whether there is any prolapse or flail. Because if there is prolapse or flail, you already answered your question, what is the mechanism of the mitral regurgitation? Take home messages number two, always think about the etiology, as I said just now. Differentiate leaflet problem compared to annulus problem and compared to the ventricle problem because they are completely different diseases. We tend to be very aggressive in primary mitral regurgitation. Primary battery regurgitation due to fibroelastin deficiency or maximum degeneration, meaning flail or prolapse, is almost always repairable. So last time we thought that only P2 prolapse or P2 flail that is easily repairable, the rest are difficult, but now we know that the surgeon can actually repair all kinds of 
prolapse of flare leaflets. The other types of primary MR, which is calcification, rheumatic is very difficult to repair. Anytime you are dealing with calcification of the leaflet, it's very difficult to repair. Okay. And as I said before, there is also another microregurgitation that is leaflet thickening and calcification. And we approach this the same as we approach fibroelastin deficiency or maximatus degeneration in terms of when to intervene. But most of the time in this situation, we have to replace the valve. If you replace a repairable valve, it is wrong and it gives patient survival penalty. And for primary mitral valve regurgitation, always repair before the left ventricle decompensate. And it's earlier than you think for primary mitral regurgitation because in primary mitral regurgitation, once the ejection fraction go less than 60%, once, once the systolic dimension go more than four centimeter, you are already decompensate. Okay, because in primary mitral regurgitation, the ejection fraction should be high, should be artificially high. It is quite common to see someone with severe primary regurgitation, the ejection fraction is actually between 65 to 70%. Okay, so it is very early when you have to intervene to primary mitral regurgitation. And just few numbers to remember here, okay, so you just need to remember this number, 0 0.4 centimeters squared is effective regurgitant orifice area for mitral regurgitation when we use PISA that is considered severe, okay, 0 0.4 centimeters squared. 60 mils is regurgitant volume, meaning how much volume that come back to the left atrium that we considered severe, okay. 7 millimeter is the vena contracta, which is the region of flow convergence. So AROA of 0 0.4, regurgitant of 60 mils, and vena contracta of 7, this is all severe mitral regurgitation. 60% and 4 cm is the signs of left ventricular decompensation. So if it's less than 60%, if it's more than 4 cm, uh, less than 4 cm, uh, more than 4 cm, meaning that your left ventricle is already going into decompensation and you have to opt as soon as possible. So the one in the bracket is what we call primary mitral regurgitation, okay? For secondary MR, be it ischemic, or dilated cardiomyopathy, the problem is the ventricle. For AFMR, the problem is the annulus. So it is very important for us to differentiate ischemic MR and dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay. Now in ischemic MR, and I say this again to again, again and again, it refers to a specific subset of patient in which you have inferior wall motion abnormalities because of either right coronary artery or left circumflex ischemia or infarction. Now, this inferior regional wall motion abnormalities will pull the posterior medial papillary muscle upwards. And this displacement of the posterior medial papillary muscle upwards cause tethering and tenting of both anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflet. Because the posterior mitral valve leaflet is shorter and the posterior mitral valve leaflet has greater relationship to posterior medial papillary muscle, the PMVL is affected more in ischemic MR. So almost all the time in ischemic MR, the jet will be directed posteriorly. Okay. Now, once your LV has dilated globally, so you have global hypokinesia and the ejection fraction has gone down significantly to less than 35%. In this situation, the dilation is symmetrical. So both the anterior and posterior medial papillary muscle is pulled upwards symmetrically the same extent so in this situation still because pmvl is shorter most of the time the jet is directed posteriorly but if you have quite big lv dilatation then it is possible for the mr to be directed centrally combination of lv dilatation on and annular dilatation in ischemic mr you have very minimal annular dilatation in patient with dilated cardiomyopathy, you have annular dilatation, but it's not as big as you imagine. It's not as big as AFMR. There is annular dilatation, but still, in dilated cardiomyopathy, the tethering and tenting of the mitral valve leaflet is the main cause of the problems. Therefore, if you notice, if you send patient for surgery, for example, for bypass surgery, and they have concomitant severe mitral regurgitation, and you only put ring around the mitral valve, so what happened is, 
there is quite often recurrent of that mitral valve regurgitation because the main problem is tethering and tenting, the pulling of the leaflet upwards. Putting a ring around the annulus wouldn't solve that problem. In all the situation above, for secondary MR or primary MR, if surgery is not an option, now we have an option, a proven option based on the latest quiet trial by using mitral clip. So mitral clip can be considered. Just now I've talked about mitral valve repair. So mitral valve repair, we actually use it mainly for flail and prolapse. Sometimes we also use it for rheumatic, but just leave it for flail and prolapse for the time being. So this is a gold standard in terms of repair of primary mitral regurgitation. So there's two types of repair. One is called corpunctia repair. So because if you have prolapse, for example, P2 prolapse of the mitral valve, so in carpentier repair, they actually just take that part of the leaflet prolapse and they resected it up. So they reset that prolapse part up and then after that, they connect end to end of the rest of the segment. So that is carpentier repair. It is the earlier repair and more frequently done. Essentially, the part of flail and prolapse leaflet is resected out and the ends are then sutured together. When you do carpentier repair, the ring that you put around the annulus is either rigid or semi-rigid ring. So that is carpentier repair. Now, there is a disadvantage of carpentier repair. Number one is in carpentier repair, you have to reset the leaflet. In American correction, you don't reset the leaflet. Okay, you don't reset the leaflet. So whenever there is a flail leaflet, what they do is they put a new cordae. So they put a cordae to resuspend the leaflet that is either flailing or prolapsing rather than taking out the leaflet. So this is done more and more now. The advantage is because you don't reset leaflet in, in the American correction, because you don't reset the leaflet, your mitral valve area during diastole is preserved. Another thing that is an advantage of American correction is the ring is fully flexible. As you know, our mitral annulus and aortic annulus is very closely related because in ventricular systole, the aortic annulus will get bigger and the mitral annulus will become closer and diastole, there will be vice versa in terms of changes. And this relationship is very important. And if you put a flexible ring, this will maintain the relationship and also maintain the proper movement of the mitral aortic curtain and also the subvalvular apparatus. And as I said just now, rather than resect the leaflet, they put a new cordae, uh, artificial cordae tendine to resuspend the leaflet. So they don't take out the leaflet. So I hope you understand the main two difference between carpentier repair and also American correction. So why do I say patient with primary mitral regurgitation have supranormal ejection fraction? Only primary, okay? Now the reason in mitral regurgitation is so mitral regurgitation is the, this valve between the left ventricle and the left atrium. The reason the ventricle will go into irreversible decompensation early at ejection fraction of 60% or systolic dimension of 4 cm is because this concept of preload reserve and afterload mismatch. In patients with severe primary mitral regurgitation, if let's say you are in a center that have very low mortality for surgical repair, even if the patient is asymptomatic and they have severe MR, you do repair. In fact, more aggressively, once you diagnose severe mitral regurgitation, even the patient is not symptomatic and the left ventricle is okay, if your center, if a center of excellence, you still send patient for mitral valve repair. Now, what happened in severe mitral regurgitation? Number one is you have volume overload of the left ventricle. So you have increased preload of the left ventricle. So you know from Stalin law, increased preload of the left ventricle cause increase in contractility. So if you have increase in preload, you have increase in ejection fraction. That's number one. Number two, in patient with severe MR, the blood is pumped not only into the aorta, it also pumped back into the left atrium. And left atrium is very compliance chamber. So it's also reduced the afterload. So you have increase in your preload. You have reduced your afterload. Increased preload cause increase in injection fraction. Reduced afterload cause increase in injection fraction. For Therefore, in patient with primary MR, their EF is artificially high compared to other people. 
So the threshold is less, which is 60% rather than normal 50 or 55%. So more volume there in diastole, more volume ejected into the left atrium causing afterload to be coming down. So when preload is increased and afterload is reduced, in patient with severe MR primary, the ejection fraction is artificially high. Okay, I hope you understand this concept. Now, there is other classification that is called Carpentier classification of mitral regurgitation. Now, the Carpentier classification is the classification that looks at the movement of the leaflet that cause mitral regurgitation. So, you have three groups. So, you have Carpentier class 1. In Carpentier class 1, the leaflet itself is normal in terms of their movement. There's no problem with the leaflet. In this situation, the only problem is the annular dilatation. For example, someone with chronic atrial fibrillation that I told just now. Okay? Very rarely, you can have perforation. For example, someone with infective endocarditis. So type 1 is normal leaflet motion. Type 2 is excessive leaflet motion. So this is your prolapse and flail, your primary mitral regurgitation that is uh, prolapse or flailing, either fibroimulation deficiency or maxillometer's degeneration. And lastly, restricted leaflet motion. So you have Carpentier class 3A. This is restricted during both systole and diastole. So this happened either in rheumatic calcification of the mitral valve leaflet or degenerative calcification of mitral valve leaflet. And another one is Carpentier 3B, which is restricted closure in systole. And you have tethering and tenting of the mitral valve leaflet. Therefore, if you have prolapse or flail, you are in Carpentier 2 classification. If you have ischemic MR, it is normally Carpentier 3B with slight combination from type 1. So because you know that ischemic MR, they have minimal annular dilatation. For dilated cardiomyopathy, also 3B with also variable degree of annular dilatation. Okay, This is Carpentier classification. Sometimes people talk about the difference between prolapse and bellowing. So the difference is not so important, but I just wanted to share with you just in case you heard the term before. So both of these actually refer to a condition of primary mitral valve prolapse. Now in prolapse, usually the tips of the leaflet when it coap, it is above the annulus, whereas in bellowing, the tip is still below the annulus. So I show you a picture here. So this is a billowing here. So you can see a prolapse segment there and a prolapse segment there. But the tip of the coaptation point is still above the annulus. Okay? Still, uh, sorry, it's below the annulus here. So this is billowing. So the tip is below the annulus. In prolapse, the tip is actually below the, above the level of annulus. So prolapse, the tip is above the level of annulus, billowing, the Tips is below the level of, of annulus. So it says that prolapse is actually worse than bellowing. So I wanted to show you simple approach of management for mitral regurgitation for prolapse, flail, rheumatic, degenerative. So this is primary mitral regurgitation. And the next one is for secondary, ischemic or functional mitral regurgitation. So primary mitral regurgitation we intervene only when the mitral regurgitation is severe. Now, whenever it is severe, once the patient is symptomatic, they have a ticket to operating theater. Doesn't matter what their left ventricle is. Okay, once they are symptomatic, they have to go for operating theater. They say they are asymptomatic when you see them in clinic. So what happens is you look at the left ventricle function. Is left ventricle function okay or not? If it's already less than 60% or more than four centimeter, meaning that the left ventricle is already decompensate. In this situation, you need to send the patient for operation. Okay. Now, for prolapse and flail, the operation is repair. For rheumatic and degenerative, most likely it is replacement. Okay. So, primary will be aggressive. Once severe, once symptomatic, we send the patient for surgery. Okay. Even more aggressively, once it's severe, we send them for surgery. Now, for ischemic and functional MR, remember the problem is the problem of the left ventricle. Now, when you have left ventricular problem, you need to ask yourself a question. What can I do to make the left ventricle better? So if they say this is because of coronary artery disease, what you need to do is to try to correct the coronary artery disease first. Either do, do either 
do coronary angioplasty or do coronary artery bypass graft. Okay, so for secondary MR, regardless, try to correct the left ventricle first. If the severe mitral regurgitation it is caused by something that can be operated on, for example, coronary artery disease or aortic valve problem, then you go and operate the patient and at the same time you repair or you replace the mitral valve. Okay. Now, what if there is nothing to operate on? The only problem is severe mitral regurgitation, secondary. For example, someone with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, they also have severe MR. In this situation, we only treat if they have symptomatic, severe, but not responding to treatment. Then we intervene. And now we have a new treatment called mitral clip that shows effectiveness in terms of treatment of secondary mitral regurgitation. This is from a recently published trial called COAP trial, in which mitral clip shows survival benefit in patients with secondary mitral regurgitation. It will surprise you to know that even though we have been repairing mitral valve for secondary, okay, for primary, we don't have any controversy. For secondary, even though we have been repairing and replacing the valve for so long, we haven't proved mortality benefit yet until the publication of COAP trial. Okay. Now, I just wanted to give you a few tips, okay? Now, pure annular dilatation, apart from chronic atrial fibrillation, is uncommon. So when we are dealing with ischemic MR, we are mainly dealing with restricted closure, which is type, 3 pre, type 3B problem, and just small contribution from annular dilatation, usually in the region of P2, P3. So that's why strategy of pulling only ring provide unsatisfactory outcome. And another thing, even though maximator's valve is considered type 2 Carpentier, the annulus tend to be large. So every time we repair primary MR, we also put ring around the annulus. I told you already, don't forget the type of degenerative MR consists of thickening and calcification. Now in secondary MR, be it ischemic or dilated, it is mostly due to displacement of papillary muscle. Okay, The dilatation of the left ventricle per se does not contribute so much. And last time we have this theory saying that when you have ischemia, it's the papillary muscle dysfunction that causes the MR. So that theory is not correct. In fact, we need our papillary muscle function to be intact for us to have MR because it is the one that pull the leaflet upwards. So once your papillary muscle dysfunction, the MR will be less as the contraction is weaker. All right. Now, once you see someone with mitral regurgitation in echocardiogram, how to tell the severity of the mitral regurgitation from echocardiogram? Number one, you look at the patient, the echo 2D appearance. Look carefully. Do you have any problem with the leaflet or not? Is there any prolapse or flail segment? Always try to look at that. That's number one. Number two, look at the leaflet. Is the leaflet calcified? Now, if the leaflet start to calcify from the tips, you are dealing with rheumatic mitral valve disease. If the leaflet start to calcify from the annulus, you are dealing with degenerative mitral valve disease. Okay, look at the leaflet also. Now, then you look at where is the jet directed for mitral regurgitation. Remember, in patient with prolapse or flail, the jet is directed in opposite direction. So if you have posterior mitral valve prolapse or flail, the jet will be directed anteriorly. If you have anterior mitral valve prolapse or flail, the jet will be directed posteriorly. Okay, that's special with flail and prolapse. For ischemic MR, for dilated cardiomyopathy, the jet is almost always directed posteriorly because the posterior mitral valve leaflet is more restricted. Also for rheumatic mitral degradation, also directed posteriorly. In patient with annular dilatation, because of chronic AF, it's usually central. Also someone with a very weak LV dilatation, they also can sometimes be central jet. When you look at the jet, look at the direction, you also wanted to see how big is the jet. Does the jet fill the whole of the left atrium? The bigger the jet is, the more severe. And more importantly, when you look at the jet, see whether the jet is long or not in terms of the length. Is it just very, very, very short, flash? Okay, maybe only early or late systolic, or is it hollow systolic? Hollow systolic is more severe than early or just late systolic. You also need to see whether you see a big flow convergence. I will show you a bit later. 
and also a crowding of the mitral valve, I will also show you a little bit later. All right, and don't forget to look at the left ventricle. If they say the leaflet looks completely normal, look at the left ventricle. Is this left ventricle problem? If the LV is globally dilated, so this might be functional mitral regurgitation, or you see regional wall motion, motion abnormality at the inferior region. That is a marker for ischemic MR. Okay, that is 2D appearance. Also, a coanda effect, which is a swelling of the jet around the wall of the left atrium. If you see coanda effect, that is severe mitral regurgitation. Now, after that, you want to quantify. One of the easiest quantification is by measuring the narrowest flow of the convergence. This is called vena contracta. If it's more than seven millimeter, it is considered severe. So Michael and tricuspid valve is the same, seven millimeter. For aortic valve, it's six millimeter. For pulmonary valve, we don't have criteria of vena contracta. Look at the Doppler profile, okay? Uh, mild, Mitral regurgitation, the Doppler profile will be faint and also will be parabolic. The more dense the profile, the more triangular it is, the more severe the mitral regurgitation. The velocity of the MR does not correlate with severity. Okay, the velocity just want to show you how good your left ventricle is, have nothing to do with the severity. See also in the Doppler profile is the flow hollow systolic. And one of the tips that I wanted to give you, sometimes patient with prosthetic valve, you cannot see the jet. Okay, if you cannot see the jet, look at the E point in your mitral inflow. If it's more than 1.2 meter second, that is a sign of severe mitral regurgitation. And finally, in all my patients, I try to do a PISA method. So PISA is actually a variation of continuity equation. What goes in must go up. So the flow that going into the or regurgitant orifice must also go out. And I will try to do PISA for all my patients. All right, so this just wanted to show you an example. So this is someone with mitral regurgitation, that's the left ventricle there, and that is the left atrium. Now the circle here, that is the zone of flow convergence, okay? The bigger this circle here, the more severe your MR. If, the, if your MR doesn't have flow convergence like this, it is more as unlikely they have severe MR. Okay, another one is look at the vena contracta, which is the narrowest point here and measure, is it more than seven millimeter or not? Measure here, it is more than seven millimeter or not. If it's more than seven millimeter, it is considered severe. All right. Lastly, this is the coanda effect. You see the jet, the jet look narrow, but you see that it's swirling around the left atrial wall. So this is coanda effect. This is also severe mitral regurgitation. So that is a zone of flow conversion. The bigger that is, the more severe your mitral regurgitation. That is vena contracta. And that is your coanda effect. Okay. I hope you understand that part in terms of 2D appearance. Right. You can also see whether your MR is hollow systolic. So this is end diastole. This is end systole. You see this MR is hollow systole, meaning that you see MR from early until the end of systole. So this is a marker of severe MR. You can also have late systolic MR. Now, this late systolic MR is not because of eccentric jet. It is because of mitral valve prolapse. You can see this end diastole. At early systole, there is no MR. You have only MR at late systole there. Okay, this is typical of mitral valve prolapse. This situation, at early part of systole, you have MR, but late part, you don't have MR. This is an example of early mild mitral regurgitation, for example, in functional mitral regurgitation, where you can have either early, early and late without the middle, okay? So, now if I give you an example, so this is a Doppler of a mitral regurgitation. So can you tell me whether this is hollow systolic, early systolic or late systolic, right? So you see this, this is end diastole there. You can see the Doppler profile should be full from here to here, it should be full. But in the initial part, you don't have Doppler profile there. Okay, it is only late systole. So this is late systolic MR. This is very typical of mitral valve prolapse. In this situation, your effective regurgitant orifice area will overestimate the severity. You know that regurgitant volume is effective regurgitant orifice area times velocity time integral. Now, don't try to imagine that you have something here and do your VTI there. That is wrong. So what you do is you need to do your VTI only half the way, right? So with EROA of 0 0.4 centimeters squared, with pan systolic murmur, you have twice 
the late systolic murmur. Okay, so only measure what you can see, right? Always trace only when there is flow and don't extrapolate. This is what I, I mean by PISA method. So PISA is actually very easy. People just get confused because they don't understand the concept. So the concept of PISA is you try to adjust your aliasing velocity here. So that's your aliasing velocity. You try to adjust it so that you have a nice circular flow convergence there. So once you have a circular flow convergence, why you want it to be a circle? Because you want to have a certain geometrical assumption for you to calculate the flow. So what flows that goes in is equal to the flow that goes out. So the formula for surface area of hemisphere is 2 pi r squared. So 2 pi r squared times the velocity that goes in. What is the velocity that goes in? That is a lysing velocity. So 2 pi r is the radius there. 2 pi r squared times a lysing velocity is equal to max velocity of the regurgitant valve times the effective regurgitant orifice area. Therefore, effective regurgitant orifice area is 2 pi r squared times the aliasing velocity divided by the max velocity of the micro regurgitation jet. So you get your EROA. Okay? Once you want to get your regurgitation volume is your EROA times your velocity time integral. Okay? One more time, the equation is 2 pi r squared times aliasing velocity going in equal to MRV max times EROA. So EROA is 2 pi r squared times aliasing velocity over the MRV max. Then you get your EROA. To get your regulated volume, it is EROA times times the velocity time integral of your MR jet. Okay. When in exam, one thing that like they, they like to confuse you is they don't write the aliasing velocity. They expect you to find your own aliasing velocity here, which is the aliasing velocity. It is the lowest one compared to the two. Okay, this one is 38.5. So put 38.5 as your aliasing velocity. So 2 pi r, r is the radius here. Okay, and aliasing velocity is here. Remember to use centimeter for all. Okay, they like to change the, uh, the, the, the symbol, right? Because you see the max MR is usually in meter per second. Change it to centimeter per second times 100. Okay, so that is your MRV max. This is your VTI, that is your radius, that is your aliasing velocity. Make sure all in centimeter. This, if you take board exam, sure, confirm, short will come up. I just wanted to start the different, different type of MR with number one, which is the newest MR that you might not realize exists. This is called atrial functional MR, AFMR. This is a relatively new entity, 6 to 7% of loan atrial fibrillation and up to 53% in patients with half path. For example, you see someone in muscle regurgitation. So what do I ask you? Look at leaflet first. There is no flail. There is no prolapse. There is no thickening. There is no calcification. You look at the left ventricle. The left ventricle systolic function looks good. So this is not ischemic or functional MR. However, you not, there is not, not an OTE that the left atrium is big. Okay, and the patient have concomitant chronic atrial fibrillation. Okay, so this is AFMR. The chronic atrial fibrillation causes LA to be dilated, and when the LA is dilated, there is less coaptation, and you have mitral regurgitation. Okay, how to treat this? You treat by treating the MR. If you are able to change the MR to sinus freedom, you might be able to reduce the size of the left atrium and reduce the size of annulus. The other way, if you cannot do that, is of course to put a ring around the annulus. This AF causes the LA to be dilated and reduce the leaflet coaptation, and the jet can be either central or posteriorly directed. This is just a cartoon of how atrial functional MR happen. So you have chronic atrial fibrillation, you have the LA that is dilated like this. When you have the LA that is dilated, you have this posterior mitral valve leaflet that is pulled apart from the anterior mitral valve leaflet. So what happened is you have reduced coaptation. Okay, now. Not only that, just give me a moment. So not only that you have reduced co-optation, the posterior mitral valve leaflet is also pulled towards the back here, away from the basal infralateral wall of the left ventricle like so, like here. 
to that way. So the combination of this dilatation and this posterior leaflet is pulling upwards is the one that causes AFMR, atrial functional mitral regurgitation. This is an example of atrial functional MR. So this is a manual clinic format. In manual clinic format, the left LV and LA is on this side. So whenever I'm presenting a manual clinic format, I will show you, I will tell you where is the LV and LA. You can see that the LA is very dilated. You can see that the left ventricle is actually normal. This is a pacemaker on the right side of the heart. Okay. Now, if you look at the jet, the jet is very severe and is directed posteriorly. So this is an example of atrial functional mitral regurgitation. Show you one more example of atrial functional MR. So look at this. Now the mitral valve looks okay. I don't see any obvious prolapse or flail of the mitral valve leaflet. The left ventricular systolic function is normal. Now, if you have inferior wall abnormalities, you can see inferior wall abnormalities here, but there is no inferior wall abnormalities, but this patient still have mitral regurgitation. When I look at the rhythm, it is an atrial fibrillation. And you look at the color jet, you can see severe AFMR, atrial functional mitral regurgitation. So I show you again, the leaflet looks normal. There is no flail or, pro or prolapse. And also the left ventricle looks normal. So this is two example of AFMR. So that is one that we have gone through, AFMR, okay? Now look at this case here. Okay, look at this three picture here. So this is a parasternal long axis view. Okay, this is parasternal long axis view with color. And this is a 3D on fast view, okay? Now look at this parasternal long axis view. First look at the leaflet. Is there any evidence of leaflet flail or prolapse or not? Okay, from here, there is no obvious flail or prolapse, no obvious thickening or calcification. Now, secondly, I look at my left ventricle. Is my left ventricle normal or not? Looking at the basal anteroceptal here, that is normal. Okay, however, look at the basal infralateral here. It is actually thin and almost aneurysmal. Just look at that, thin and aneurysmal. Okay, now look at the jet now. Look at the jet. So the jet is directed posteriorly. So remember, I tell you, if they have flail or prolapse, it should be opposite direction. If it's coming MR, remember, I tell you, because posterior leaflet is short and more easily tethered, the jet is almost always directed posteriorly. And you can see this, leaflet look normal, inferior wall motion abnormalities, and jet is directed posteriorly. What else I wanted to know? I want to see what is the vena contractor. Is it more than 7 millimeter? I want to see whether the jet is hollow systolic. And after that, I also can do PISA to see what is the severity of this MR. So looking at this, I assume that the MR is severity. So you have to make sure that you have do all due diligence before saying MR is severe, all right? And looking at this, with this inferior wall motion abnormalities, I can say that this patient most likely have ischemic mitral regurgitation, all right? Now, what else does this echo show you? Okay, what something else that this echo show you is this. The leaflet should co-app down here, but you see the leaflet is co-app very high there. You have an area here. That means that this, both of these leaflet are tendered and tented. But you see how short the posterior leaflet compared to anterior leaflet. So that's why posterior leaflet is affected more. So this here is tenting area and that's there is tenting height. So when we do coronary angiogram, the patient have severe triple vessel disease. So this patient have echo suggesting of ischemic severe mitral regurgitation and also have coronary artery disease. So this is an ischemic mitral regurgitation. You also can see from 2D view here. Now, if you if you remember what I said, anterior mitral valve leaflet, posterior mitral valve leaflet, you can see there is mild co-optation because of tethering and tenting of both of the leaflet causing severe mitral regurgitation, right? So what would you do, do in this kind of patient? So this patient have is coming MR, remember, always think about what is best for the left ventricle. If you think the best for the left ventricle is doing PCI, you PCI the patient and hope that the left ventricle will remodel and your MR will get better. However, if you think that bypass is good, then you send the patient for bypass, but because the patient have concomitant severe MR, it is reasonable to at the same time do either mitral valve repair or mitral valve replacement in this situation. So this is someone with ischemic MR with tethering and tenting of the mitral valve leaflet. Now, if let's say you do PCI and the MR is not getting better, or you do bypass, the MR is not getting better, what you can do is mitral clip. And mitral clip is one of the options for you to do. 
So always think about what I can do to make the ventricle better, then only think about what to do with the MR. So this is ischemic MR. It's usually either because of RCA ischemia or infarction. You have regional wall motion abnormality of the inferior wall. You have apical displacement, but especially of the posterior medial papillary muscle. You have tethering and tenting, especially affecting the PMVL. Number one, it is shorter. Number two, it is in closer relation to posterior medial papillary muscle. You have posteriorly directed MR jet. Normally, the annulus is either not dilated or very slightly dilated at the region of P2, P3 of the annulus. And the LV function is usually not so bad. Okay, it's between more than 35 or more than 40%. Okay. Right, so this is ischemic MR. Now, I want to do a little bit segue into the function of mitral clip. Now, mitral clip is an indication for someone that is not fit for you to go for surgery. Okay, you can do it for either primary MR or secondary MR. Now, the problem with primary MR is prolapse of flare. We only already have established treatment for that. We do repair for that. So there is no issues. So we hardly, we shouldn't consider mitral clip for primary MR unless patient is really cannot go for surgery. Okay. However, recently, there is new publication called COAP trial that show that mitral clip. So what is mitral clip? Mitral clip is a procedure where we put a catheter inside the femoral vein into the right atrium. Then you do a transeptal puncture. With that clip, you can actually clip the anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflet. Okay, just like a clip, like your, you know, your, your laundry clip. Okay. Now, so what happened is in COAP trial, they noticed that there is quite a significant subpopulation of secondary MR, be it ischemic or non-ischemic MR, in which the patient that have mitral clip have improved survival. Like I show you, this has never been shown for secondary mitral irritation. So what kind of patient that will benefit from mitral clip? The one that benefit from mitral clip is actually subpopulation that is called disproportionate mitral regurgitation. What do I mean by disproportionate mitral regurgitation? When you look at the left ventricle, the left ventricle is not so bad. It's not very dilated. The ejection fraction is not so low, but you have severe mitral regurgitation. Okay, you have severe MR in the setting in of not so much LV dilatation. That is disproportionate MR. And COAP show that disproportionate MR benefit a lot from mitral clip. The other group that is not beneficial is someone that is called proportionate MR, in which the LV is very dilated and the MR is not so severe. So this is proportionate, and it seems that this patient does not benefit so much from mitral clip. So for many years, we have no treatment that effectively reduce mortality in secondary MR. The COAP trial changed all that. They show that in a select group of heart failure patients, the mitral clip actually do work. This is publication of my, uh, this co-app is actually just one month after a publication of Mitra FR that showed that Mitra Click is not useful. And co-app actually clear us of which population that will benefit from Mitra Click. The key here is to understand, is the MR just a bystander, like in someone with proportional MR, or the MR is in own propagation? You know, MR that is severe, we get more MR that is more severe in the disproportionate mitral degradation. Now, in proportionate MR, the LV is severely dilated and the MR is not so severe. In this case, intervention with mitral clip does not give good result. In this proportionate MR, on the other hand, the LV dilatation is not so severe and the MR is disproportionately severe. So it is in this group of patients that mitral clip is beneficial. And as you can see, it is very important, especially for our typical severe ischemic MR. Because remember, I tell you, ischemic MR, the EF is usually more than 35%. And the problem is only regional wall motion abnormality of the inferior side of the left ventricle. Right, just a segue into a quiet trial. So far, I have shown you atrial functional MR, and I have also shown you ischemic MR. So we have a 55 years old man with chest pain of six hours duration. The pain is very severe and the blood pressure, patient blood pressure is very low. When you examine the patient, you heard a soft systolic murmur. ECG shows ST elevation in the inferior lid. So this is inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. So whenever you hear a pan systolic murmur in patient with MI, your differential diagnosis must be acute MR, secondary to papillary muscle rupture, or acute ventricular septal rupture. So look at this echo here. You can see a parasternal long axis view. You can see clearly in this 
echo that the anterior leaflet is not normal. You can see flail of anterior mitral valve leaflet. Okay, that's flail anterior mitral valve leaflet. And you can also see posteriorly directed MR jet. So remember I tell you, in patient with flail or prolapse, the jet is directed in the opposite direction. So this patient have anterior mitral valve flail. You can see that the jet is directed posteriorly. Okay, anterior flail directed posteriorly. So this is flail anterior mitral valve leaflet. And this is a beautiful example of Koanda effect. You see the swelling of the jet inside the left atrium. So even though it is a narrow jet, but because it is swelling on the left atrium, that is actually severe MR. Now, I just wanted to show you again the appearance of on fast view of the mitral valve anterior mitral valve leaflet, posterior, remember, A1, A2, A3, P1, P2, P3 scallop. When you look at surgeon view, this is always lateral because that is where your left atrial appendage here, that is only medial, the interatrial septum, and the aortic valve will be at 12 o'clock. Here is your mitral aortic curtain, okay? And the bump here is the, this something that is called taurus aorticus. So we have flail anterior mitral valve leaflet with ruptured papillary muscle. So most common papillary muscle that ruptured is postromedial papillary muscle because they only have a single blood supply. This likely need to replacement. So other primary MR can be repaired, but someone with acute MI, they need replacement, usually because of tissue refriability. You can repair them, but most probably you need replacement. In acute severe MR, so most of the time, all of this lecture, we're talking about chronic MR. This is the only time we're going to talk about acute severe MR. EROA is more important than regurgitation volume because the LV have not yet have the chance to dilate. In prolapse with late systolic murmur, regurgitation volume is so in chronic MR, regurgitation volume is more important. In acute MR, EROA is more important, but mostly we're talking about chronic MR. Let's look at third case. We have 52 years old lady went to GP and was told to see you because of incidental murmur. On examination, you hear late systolic murmur. So you hear late systolic murmur already give you a red flag. Next, you order an echocardiogram for the patient. So this echo for the patient now. Look at the echo. This is parasternal long axis view. Okay, firstly, what do we do? Look at the leaflet. Is there any obvious abnormality of the leaflet or not? Look at this anterior mitral valve leaflet. It looks thickened. And look at this, it looks rather prolapsing. You can see that the anterior mitral valve leaflet look like it prolapsing into the left atrium. Okay, so now you already say, okay, there is seems to be a prolapse. Does this patient have mitral regurgitation because of this prolapse? Look at the left ventricle, the ejection fraction looks normal. The anterior wall look okay, so the basal anterior septum look okay. The basal and mid inferior lateral wall is also okay, so the left ventricle looks normal. Now, look at the color. Yes, there is jet and the jet is directed posteriorly. This also tally into your view here. This is more anterior leaflet prolapse. You know the jet will be directed posteriorly. Yes, the jet is directed posteriorly, okay? Is it pan systolic or is it very brief? You look at this echo, even though the jet look quite severe, but it's very brief, okay? When you look at the 3D view here, you can see, okay, this is anterior mitral valve leaflet. Look how thick is that anterior mitral valve leaflet. You can see that you have quite big A2 prolapse there, big A3 prolapse there, and small P3 prolapse, okay? So this is an example of someone with mitral valve prolapse secondary to myxomatous degeneration or Barlow's disease with posteriorly directed MR jet. So the question is, is the MR severe or not? Because we only intervene on severe MR, right? So we do a quantitative measure. We see that the EROA is 0 0.3 and the regurgitant volume is 30. So is it severe or not? So if you remember the number that I have to ask you to remember, EROA of 0 0.4 and regurgitant volume of 60. So this patient hasn't gone through that threshold yet. So this is not severe mitral regurgitation. Okay, now the ejection fraction is 55%. So some of you might be worried. Remember I told you that for primary MR, the threshold of repair is EF of 60%. Now this is 55%, maybe you are worried, but you don't need to be worried because remember, patient only go to supranormal EF when the patient without severe mitral regurgitation, the EF will be like other people. So this patient, she doesn't have severe MR, so the EF shouldn't be artificially high. 
So the EF that is 55% is normal. Unless the patient have severe MR, in that situation only we worry that ejection fraction has come down. Okay, so we don't do anything for this patient. This patient is totally okay for just follow up, right? If this patient which has have severe MR, then we need to send the patient for mitral valve repair, not replacement, repair, okay? So this is also known as a click murmur. So mitral valve prolapse also known as click murmur. Why click murmur? And the mid systole, the coronary tendine become taut. As it become taut, you hear the click and the murmur is late systole. So this is primary maximus prolapse valve. Let's look at the fourth case. 76 years old man with three months history of exertional dyspnea and atypical chest pain. Echocardiogram done one year ago shows grade one diastolic dysfunction with no significant valvular abnormalities. Also have hypertension that is well controlled with combination of vasartan and amlodipine. Look at the echocardiogram here. Okay, this is parasternal long axis view. All right, look what happened here. Okay. Look at this anterior mitral valve leaflet. Okay, look at this. You can see that the anterior mitral valve leaflet is actually flailing. So there's anterior mitral valve leaflet that is flail. You can see a ruptured cordae at the end of anterior mitral valve leaflet here. You don't see the thickened as if maxometers valve. You can see a normal looking thin leaflet but flailing. So this is an example of fibroelastic deficiency with anterior mitral valve leaflet flail. You can see that the RV is dilated. That means that this has been loft standing so that the patient already has secondary pulmonary hypertension. Look at the left ventricle, it is still normal. So you have flail of anterior mitral valve leaflet, you expected the jet to be directed posteriorly. Okay. Now look at this, this is, this is the tricuspid valve. So you have primary mitral valve problem. So that is anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. That is probably the posterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. You can see that the RV is also dilated. This patient have secondary pulmonary hypertension. Right, as we expected, you see that the jet is directed posteriorly. Okay, because of flail and three mitral valve reflux. And you can see also quite a big region of flow convergence here. Okay, so this looks like a severe mitral degradation, secondary of flail anterior mitral valve leaflet. So what you want to do in this case, remember this is a primary MR, it is flail, it is severe and the patient is symptomatic. So this patient need to go for surgery. All right, look at TR, the TR jet is quite significant. It is dense. Okay, you also have significant pulmonary regurgitation. So this patient have also have secondary tricuspid regurgitation and secondary pulmonary hypertension. And remember what I teach you about tricuspid regurgitation. Every time you go for operation and you want to intervene for left-sided heart disease, if you have severe TR, you have to repair that TR. If you have TR that's only mild, but you have dilation of tricuspid annulus more than 40 millimeter, you also have to repair the tricuspid valve. So this is someone with EROA of 0 0.69 severe and regression volume of 69. So this patient have flail and three mitral valve reflux with severe MR. The patient also has severe secondary tricuspid regurgitation. This is likely fibroelastin deficiency. So I've shown you before, which is Maxometers and Barlow's. Now I'm showing you fibroelastin deficiency. Repair or replace, remember, always repair 